Good evening, everyone, Good evening. and welcome to the 22nd day of the New Earth Summit, now in its third year. India's first integrative summit on solutions to our problems in health, food, farming, and environment. I'm Daryl D'Souza, convener of the New Earth Summit, your host this evening. And I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists and to our audience. Also on behalf of our 10 Earthkeeper groups in India and overseas, we express our gratitude to you for taking our time to be with us this evening and to share your insights and experience so that all watching this live webinar and its recording later may benefit for the, from the holistic science and wisdom being shared on this platform. That will help us all co-create a beautiful world. Our topic for today is water conservation techniques. And then we will talk about the Water Management Committee. So I'll start with introducing our panelists uh, to the audience. Romain uh, San Francisco holds a master's degree in public administration. A 15 year stint as projects coordinator of Center for Hepatology pioneer in conservation, research, and ecological studies in mainland India and the Andaman and Nicobar archipelago, providing solid grounding in environmental solutions. As project head of Samarpan Foundation, Chennai, she conceptualized an outdoor laboratory of learning through applied sustainable practices, raising forest nurseries, mangroves, organic farming, mosquito eradication, rainwater harvesting, and waste management. Romain is the chairperson of Environment Goa Chapter, ALL, All Ladies League. And she has received awards for Rose of Rizwan, Achievement in the Field Environment, and Exceptional Women of Excellence 2018 at the Women's Economic Forum. Our second panelist, Abhinav Apte, who will join us shortly. He is a mechanical engineer, an MBA, and certified monitor with 14 years of industrial experience, out of which more than five years are in the field of environment. As the general manager of Leela Environmental Solutions, his vision is for the organization to become a leader in sustainable solutions with a core focus on water. Leela is a company based in Panjim and offers solutions in rainwater harvesting, sewage and effluent treatment, efficient <laughs> plumbing solutions, and micro irrigation, that is, drip and sprinkler solutions. The company has executed key projects in these areas for both government and corporate clients in Goa. Our third panelist, Captain Joseph Lobo, is a master mariner by profession and managing director of a shipping company. He developed interest in good governance issues and joined Agni as a trustee. On shifting to Goa, he involved himself in treating sewage and garbage. As manager of Green Goa Works, he managed Sonsodo garbage site for one year under contract to Goa Foundation. Compost was produced and sold to farmers. Since quitting GGW and starting on his own, Joseph Lobo exclusively dealt with sewage and water body rehabilitation. He executed a project in Santines Creek, which is in Panjim, Goa, financed by CIPLA CSR and promoted by chairman of DSPCB and Panjim MLA Siddharth Kukulnikar. Joseph was Joseph has 80 sewage treatment projects that deals with 12 million liters of sewage per day and whose process is patented by GOI. So for the first hour of this webinar, 
I have a few questions for our panelists that will be followed by question and answers with our audience at 7 p.m. Okay. You can type the questions in the Q&A box even before that time. If you would like to receive the recording of this webinar, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The New Earth Summit. So now I will uh, start with my questions to the panelists. Um, Captain uh, Joseph Lobo, you know, um, of course, in water conservation, there are small techniques that uh, people already know in their homes. For example, uh, putting a smaller, you know, shower uh, cap so that it's not a wide uh, spread of water. And instead of a shower, using uh, a bucket, for example, uh, not leaving the tap running when you're brushing your teeth. You know, that's what some people do or shaving and uh, other small techniques. But uh, if you could uh, tell us more about this wonderful uh, system that you have made for treating gray water and black water in the home, uh, that is uh, for people to understand it, you know, the toilet water and your wash basin and bathroom water. So... Uh, you have a wonderful system that treats it and recycles it. So could you share that uh, with us? Uh, I have a few slides uh, which you had shared before. If you would like me to put them on when you're explaining, I'll do that. And uh, that I, I, yes, and uh, lastly, I, I think, you know, that the system was so amazing because I think every home, uh, not only in Goa, but other states also, and even the societies should have it because of the way you've designed it. And it's not only recycling, but it's also, you know, using it for plants. Yes, Captain Luke. Yeah. Before I just go for a little bit of introduction into what you have said. Yeah. The first thing, you know, I have a farm in, in Kandas in, uh, in Maharashtra. And... Um, there, you know, uh, there is a big lake there and every day the woman from the village used to go down to the lake and pick up water and bring it to the village and they used to use it. And it was, uh, I noticed everyone managed to carry them, these women managed to carry just two containers back home. Then I met the Sarpanch and I told him, I said, why this inconvenience to the whole village women? Why not put a pump and a tank and store water and then give outlets over there for these uh, poor women going all the way there? It's almost a kilometer long, a, a kilometer away. Well, he did that. The next thing you know, these same women were fighting, each one bringing five to six containers. And the line was so long, it took almost one hour for the next person to reach the tap. So the whole... Uh, exercise failed in the sense that when there is surplus you forget the need you want you just you concentrate on the wants and that's what happened and it became a riot because there were fights women between the women and the serpent stayed far away you know what happens when you mix up with a fight between women so he stayed far away and the whole thing became a real mess so anyway, that was my first uh, incident. Of, I mean, the first thing I wanted to make uh, a point was that as long as we have tap water, we will continue to waste. Because we do not understand the worth of that water. And this tap water leaves a huge carbon footprint because it's not only about pumping, it's about the pipes, about the labor. It's about so many other things that come to finally bring that tap water into your home. And they give it very cheap. So because it's cheap, you use it as much as you want. So I just wanted to make that first point. The second point I wanted to say was, Goa has been blessed with such a lot of surplus rain. But as soon as the rain stops, there is no water in villages. There is no water in areas. And I say, why? We had enough water to last us for the whole year. If you take 100 inches, we had much more than 100 inches per square meter. That means three meters. 
three cubic meters. That means 3,000 cubic meters in one square meter. You multiply that, we have enough water to last our lifetime. That means one year's rain for three years, we, it could last us. But we didn't do anything. That's the second point I wanted to make. The third point is, Goa is blessed with wells. But most of these wells have not been touched because they say it's dirty. But these wells are source of good water that has been tapped and it has been what you call divined by our ancestors. Those wells are ready to be tapped anytime. All we need to do is to start pumping out those wells, that, as I mentioned in my last uh, seminar, and the water will automatically start getting clean. And the second point, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Romain. If you don't pump out the water, how will the aquifers get filled up? And if you don't pump out the water, how will the aquifers get cleaned? Because aquifers are just like pipes. If you don't use the water in the pipe, the pipe slowly starts getting choked by sedimentation. And finally, you find that you have only 20 to 30% of the flow because you didn't use that water. This is exactly what's happening with wells. And if we start pumping out water, we will start nourishing those wells and you will get clean, clear water, crystal clear water, which has been filtered through the, the soil, mineral water. And when it comes into those wells, it will be sparkling water. I'm using wells now for the last 12 years. Not a single day have I run out of water, come whether as a drought or no drought. And last year, I had a little sedimentation because rains came late. And I said, let me clean the water during the peak summer. I tried to empty out my well. I took out almost 80,000 liters and water was still there. That is five hours of pumping, two pumps and nothing happened. The well kept filling up. And today I have crystal clear water because the wells were, the aquifers were all flushed. Okay, so this was just an introduction. And I would like to show you the, the second point. Now, this is my farm in Kandas. Okay, this is my farmhouse over there. This is a dam that we built through the government soil conserv uh, water conservation department. And this is the water that is in the dam. Wherever there's green space is where I practice water harvesting. And if you look at the areas around, nothing has been done. Now, what did I do? That was the second point I wanted to say was the whole slope of the land is in this direction. Now, when rain beats on the soil, the soil becomes impervious, impervious to rain percolating into the water, into the field. So, what rain does is, is picks up the silt. It picks up the silt and brings it to the surface. And when rain stops in the peak of monsoon is very hot sun. It dries it up. So what you have is like a cementation of the soil where no water can percolate. So when that happens, you have what you call runoffs. You just have runoffs where no percolation takes place. So what I did was, I used a plow, because in that area you don't have any mechanized thing, at least at that time. I used a plow and I went parallel to, I mean, went along the contours. Where the hell is my arm? I went along the contours. So I did it this way. The slope was here. I plowed in this manner, one, one meter distance. At the end of the month, at the end of my exercise, before I did it, there was water flowing out from these areas because that was the lowest slope. After doing it, the water started receding and finally no water flowed into those nullas <coughs> from the surface. Everything percolated. Once percolations took place, 
then I had enough water in the soil to start nourishing the plants. So this is what happened. And then I started putting my trees and I started growing my forest. So this is another very simple method of so that no water flows out from the lowest end. It can be done for a small plot. It can be done for a building. It can be done for any, any area to ensure that no water flows out of the plot. Once that is done, you can, you can be sure that you are now actually doing practical water harvest. And the third, the third point I wanted to make was that the best way for water harvesting is if you have an aquifer in your place. There's no point in putting water in the soil and you say that I've done water harvesting. That water that you put in the soil needs to reach an aquifer. So once you <clears throat> have the aquifer, then all you do is collect the water that is from the house tops or from places where it is flowing and direct into do the well <clears throat> using methods like filtration, soil, sand filtrations, etc. These are common filtration methods to ensure no sediments get into the water. <coughs> and now for the switch system. So this is my STAD system or switch treatment and dispersal system. This is about 50 flats over here and they produce something like 18 to 1 lakh liters per day of sewage. It's a slope on the other side. There is a more drop. And the usual thing is that this water usually gets out onto the uh, lowest part of the slope and it, it sort of creates a nuisance for all neighbors. <clears throat> so my system is basically to make sure that I treat the sewage with bacteria and then I uh, put it to the plants. So basically, I have two pumps. One pump that does the mixing in a special bioreaction tank that I have designed. <coughs> this bioreaction tank ensures that all the sediments and all the floatsome, that's the plastics, etc., remain on the first tank. I have a picture of it. So did I? Did you see this before? So this is my bioreaction tank. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so the raw sewage comes in from here. All the floatsome remains up here. <clears throat> All this heavy sediment remains down below. And the raw water and some suspended particles come into the next tank, which is the settling tank. <clears throat> and after the settling tank, some more segregation takes place. It comes to the product water tank. And I have two pumps. One pump does the recycling. I, I recycle about almost 20,000 to 30,000 liters per day. So this recycling mixes the and churns the water so that the bacteria, this is the green thing is the bacteria, gets mixed up thoroughly. And here, this is a venturi aerator. This venturi aerator makes sure that the Anaerobic conditions in the water becomes a little aerobic. Aerobic helps in the bacteria multiplication and helps in the decomposition of the solid that are there. <coughs> and this water then becomes what you call compost water. Then by a, spe a specially uh, designed distribution chambers, I give it to the plants. So this is basically the tree. Now, if you look at a tree, you will see that the maximum place where trees absorb is at the periphery. It is at this periphery. And I place my water, this, the treated water, in this periphery of a tree. Now, a mango tree would consume something like almost two and a half to 3,000 liters a day. 
a mango tree, a coconut tree uh, consumes about a thousand liters a day. Even small shrubs and plants, these shrubs and plants produces, uh, con uh, consumes about 150 liters a day. I have my sewage systems all around this area. The guests are sitting out in their verandas over here. Guests are swimming in the pool and all their sewage is being consumed in this whole uh, distribution system that I have placed next to these plants and these coconut trees in, in this environment over here. I've done in the lawn, if you can see, you can see the rows, you'll know that there's water there and all the trees around the area. And if you'll say, how do I know? This tree, I started the system in model millenniums. It is in Karanzilem and it is producing uh, 1,50,000 liters a day from 1,200 residents who stay here. And, it, and uh, this water used to create a huge nuisance because their STP failed. And they, as much as they tried, they couldn't get that STP working. And it created so much of noise and so much of electricity consumption. I started the system and 15 days later, just 15 days later, look at the difference between the plants, just 15 days later. And this is what happened when I started. I started in 2016. Today, you can see this lush greenery all being uh, what do you call fed by treated sewage water. Today, they, the temperatures in this area have reduced by almost one like fifty thousand. I mean, reduced by four to five degrees in in the temperature centigrade. <clears throat> the environment in the morning you can find out is moist because there is a lot of dew fall, and the residents are the best bioindicators to say that we are having a good time. Now all the issues that are there have been sorted out. This is the lawn. Before they used to pump their treated water here. Today, and that treated water used to create a, such a nuisance that the kids were not allowed to play on the lawn because they were falling sick. Today, this lawn is now lush and green. Not only that, we've increased a lot of plants all around the periphery, plus all around the complex. We've put almost 1.5 kilometers of garden area, running area in this complex. And uh, till today, from 2016, nothing is, uh, everybody has been happy, including the COVID times when there was 98% occupancy. Everybody didn't leave their complex. They all were you using their toilets there. So you can imagine the production of sewage has gone up almost 100%. Then we had very heavy rains, almost 1.5%, uh, uh, no, I mean almost 1.5 times more than what the normal rains were. And uh, the system handled it throughout that area. And whenever there was, a, there was no problem because if there was a problem, my men couldn't leave the, uh, the, the thing to come and service it because everything was locked up. So I'm just saying that this is another method of making sure that you conserve water because now all the fresh water that was used to water this lawn is no longer required. All the fresh water that was used to water these plants is no longer required. And now the switch system is the switch, the central switch system is coming. These people don't want to give their water because they say, where do we find so much water to water all this garden? It's 1.5 kilometers, and they're using 1,50,000 liters a day. Where are we going to get so much of fresh water? The wells dry up. So this is another way of ensuring that you are 100% uh, using your sewage. And in small complexes, like in my home, we are only two of us. We produce hardly 400 liters maximum. Now, 400 liters to water a big garden is is impossible. So what I do, I take another 6,000 liters from my well and I put it in my sewage tank and my pump does the automatic distribution of the, the treated sewage into the gardens. And so I have created a sprinkler system or a drip system using the sewage and from my own, from my septic tank. 
and that way i have increased the, the utility of my of my water that i am using in the bathrooms and another thing i don't feel ashamed now of using more water because i know every bit of my water that i use will go for my garden so if i want to keep the tap running i keep the tap running only thing is that i want to ensure that i don't increase my footprints by increasing my electric bill yes darren i've done yes wonderful wonderful system and yeah this time uh, what you mentioned uh, the last point was very interesting that you have a distribution system now which is connected to your entire garden and then all that you need to do is uh, put the water into that you know into the uh, feeder system and it will do the job whenever water is less from from your grey water and black water that's wonderful uh, now i will thank you if you could uh, close the presentation yeah I would thank you uh, welcome thank you very much. Um, i have already you know uh, read out your introduction before you could come and thank you so much sir abhinav uh, the kind of you know water conservation or treatment systems that you have been working with and the kind of work you're doing in goa yeah uh, thank you thank you daryl uh, for the introduction and daryl and uh, for also the invite uh, on this discussion interesting uh, so um, we work uh, in the field of water uh, in terms of uh, harvesting of rainwater uh, treating of sewage and effluent and also into micro irrigation systems uh, where uh, a lot of water uh, is reduced because unnecessarily watering of lawns and no uh, extra watering of lawns is avoided because it's it's a regulated system so that is the these are the three areas where we work and we have been uh, doing a lot of this kind of projects for housing uh, for uh, uh, for housing projects for villa projects for resorts and uh, colleges institutions uh, we have set up one uh, recently like this was like uh, within this year we have set up a, a, a sewage treatment uh, plant for a college in mapsa very near to mapsa and uh, the the college is um, also now taking up research uh, in in terms of it's a science college and they are also promoting that as you no know, they would do a lot of experiments is in terms of what is the you no know, bacteria level and what are the parameters that uh, that we can have control on and what needs to be done etc so it also becomes a study project for that college so that is also one thing that we have uh, done in the last uh, one year uh, after my last presentation which happened uh, in the last uh, last summit so uh, yeah so uh, i have only two three points that uh, that i would like to add I'm, most of the things that i would want to say you know captain lobo has already you know like uh, already said those things like you know um, uh, what are the things that um, why we should uh, value water it would be like again repeating the same thing so what i would take i would take have two key points that i would like to make uh, as a value addition to this to this discussion are uh, one is uh, whenever projects are taken uh, for any um, whether it is a villa whether it is a, whether it is a hotel whether it is a housing project whether it is any other project uh, the the planning of how water is going to be supplied the planning of how water is going to be used and how uh, the water is going to be recycled and again the recycled water is treated water is is going to be used uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of improvement that needs to be done in these areas uh, at at right at the planning stage a lot of projects um, when they approach us it it is at the at, at the time where though now they have to go and get the permission from the pollution control board at, at the, it is at that stage that the projects come to us and then they say no we have only so much area and then uh, how can you help us in uh, setting up a plant over there so if that if that planning uh, can uh, can be done much earlier you no know, i it, the appeal is to all architects and all developers and all the planners uh, who are listening to this uh, uh, panel discussion uh, an appeal to all of you is that if you can involve any service it may not be us it can be anybody else if that uh, service provider is involved right at the planning stage 
uh, a lot of the cost that goes into uh, plumbing, a lot of cost that goes into a sewage treatment plant, a lot of cost that goes into um, you know, the landscaping uh, that is required for um, uh, uh, for um, consuming this treated water because this treated water you cannot you know, send it out of your premises. So if if the uh, executioner or if the uh, project implementer, especially for the uh, sewage treatment, irrigation systems, water treatment, rainwater harvesting, if these vendors or these project executioners are involved at the planning stage, it can save a lot of money, one, and it can also save a lot of water uh, consumption, a lot of water, uh, it can be uh, the water can be treated in much more effective way and it's it's like a win win for all all of us like including the environment so that is one uh, point that i would like to make here the second point i would like to make here is uh, we need to document case studies where people have done brilliant works so as as, as a panel or you know, when when daryl uh, uh, like uh, spoke we had this conversation in the uh, in the afternoon that we need to have a you no know, uh, audience uh, or a citizens panel something like that so 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 when we have that panel it it would be a very interesting thing to do to document which are the case studies where people have done fantastic work in conservation of water in treatment of sewage in uh, irrigation system so if we can have a, a ready regular kind of a thing where these are documented and people can access them you know what has been done how it has been done so that people when they uh, when you talk about rainwater harvesting people say is it feasible if you show them okay this is where it has been done this is how it is uh, being done and this is how much the water it is getting saved okay how do you know whether uh, whether a sewage treatment plant or a, or a septic tank uh, or maybe a mini sewage treatment plant is is feasible for a smaller household it they, they always imagine that sewage treatment plant is for somebody who like you know, a big hotel or a big resort or brick project even a small household can have a small sewage treatment plant so when we talk about that people ask where has it been done so if we can have this uh, ready reckoner list or if we can maybe you no know, recognize them by giving them some kind of a ranking or some kind of a you no know, award that would uh, make a lot of difference uh, to 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 the uh, i'm talking in terms of changing of behavior or changing of the approach uh, in which people look at these things so these are the couple of things that you no know, i would like to add to the discussion yes uh, thank you uh, abina and now i would like to ask uh, romain you know, uh, to share a bit, uh, especially the, uh, we were talking a few days back about this uh, uh, rainwater harvesting from the roof, you know, so much of water that's going out. So, uh, yes, uh, Romain, could you please uh, uh, share with us uh, some uh, rainwater uh, harvesting and water conservation ideas that you have? So, um... On the roof, this is something I did, noticing that uh, there's such a lot of water runoff from our roofs that is lost. And you, you hear after a, uh, a day's rain, you'll just hear this water pounding down, going down and off to the river and, and lost. So I just had my carpenters set up this little thing and link my at least the back of my house, uh, the roof, the entire roof, I got it linked with simple gutters, you know, those six inch gutters that you fix below the roof, the uh, PVC gutters, yeah. And then yes. I used these big, there's some new type of PVC flexible pipes that you can join for areas that you cannot have this running, you know, the houses are a bit awkward, the roofs, uh, you know, not conducive to joining them at some places, you can use this flexible pipe to link to those channels. And I divert, diverted everything into the well. But for the front of the house, I would have to do uh, for this, before the next dry season, I will set this up for harvesting the front, straight into the pits that I um, elucidated in my presentation, the, the rainwater harvesting pits. Like Captain Lobo said, we've got to recharge as much as possible in your garden itself to be able to bring up the groundwater, I mean, the water in your well. And I realized after doing this rooftop uh, flushing into my well, you wouldn't believe because we suffered a lot with our water. We had settling tanks actually, and then would pump it up to 
uh, main tank because of the mining trucks were in the line of the mining trucks flying down to the Sirisai jetty. And uh, this was a major problem with the iron ore, you know, the water used to be awful and uh, we would lose our hair. I mean, uh, over a period of time, we realized it was, it was all this filings from these trucks that were used to fly down, thanks to Claude, it stopped now. But uh, we have to rejoice about that. And uh, so we had had this thing coming in and after doing this now for the last, uh, it's going to be three uh, two years now, it's over two years, the quality of the water itself has, you know, changed so much in the well. The, the softness of the water, because now it's pushed out all this junk that was, you know, seeping in through the aquifers, you know. This huge volume, and somebody walked in, in the monsoon this year and said, what's that you know what's that is is the rain still on i mean you know what's happening and i said that's all the rainwater going into my well from just the back roof imagine if people did this and i'm surrounded by four wells at least where people don't even use it and i i know what uh, captain lobo mentioned we got to act on this on a war footing and get people to move on that matter because i've seen them all suffering for Every now and again, it was seven days, no water, because the pipes had broken in Asnora or, or, you know, somewhere in this particular village. A lot of them have wells, but they haven't been using it. As, as Captain said, they've turned it into dead wells, which is not the case. They just refuse to clean them, use them. And that's exactly what our well was all about when we moved in here. It was a, it, this was a hundred year old house. And the well was, the water was there, but it hadn't been cleaned in years, even all the owners that hands that it passed through never did anything. And the first thing we did was to clean the well and do it periodically every summer. And that's the only way you can freshen your aquifer. And then if you put in all this rainwater annually, and this year we've got loads, I can tell you that it's going to be great for the well and, and for, for, for our use. That's from the roof. And if one did those pits along the garden where the water flows, everybody did that, then they wouldn't have a problem. I mean, the whole groundwater would change. The quality would change, in fact. With all the pollutants that are being added, you have no control over these things and what's being let out where into which river. And uh, as, as we read in the news, the amount of sewage and things that are let out. At least this is one way of ensuring that our well water is purified because we only survive on the well water. We don't have a connection and don't intend having a connection. Because I think you, you're more frugal in the use of water when you have to, you have to pump it up. You, you're more conscious of, of how much you're using and how long it, you, know, you can push it. And of course, I use a bucket. And you know, I mean, those, those are small steps. I think a little uh, talk like that would be very useful and I'm, Really uh, happy to hear what Captain Lobo was saying about using all that sewage for his garden. I wish that we could have small models like that that can be replicated in, in every little household, like uh, Abhinav just said. You know, um, we should be able to give them a small, simple remedy for a big problem. And when these people were crying and they mostly been out of, out of India and come back and uh, been in the Middle East and come back and said, what do we do? We're suffering without water. Who has a well? And they were, you know, they were running around and getting water from everybody. That is ridiculous. In the, in the height of the monsoon. Now, we are, that's a serious thing that's going on and it's going to explode. And where are the solutions? The, the, we, have to, we have to give them these solutions and in a, in a small... Uh, what, what do you say, doable package. That's, that's right, uh, Romain, you know, and uh, even an improvement for people, you know, who do not uh, want to put those uh, gray colored pipes, the half cut pipes uh, yeah. at the edge of their roof, because even my neighbors have it. And almost every second year, they have to replace, There's, there is an iron Yes, you know, it is. there's an iron bar that comes from your wooden roof and it uh, then it holds the uh, pipe at the edge of your roof. Yes. So that also starts getting rusted. So one idea was that whatever water is falling off the roof, 
you know, let it fall off the roof vertically, but down where it falls, you just have to make, uh, for example, an eight inch or 10 inch wide uh, small pit that maybe goes eight or 10 inches deep. And you fill it up with that gray color gravel or what they call Kodi, mm -hmm. the ones that they use in construction that you get anywhere when you're going to make a home. And you fill up that gravel over there. And that gravel will be, of course, if your roof is in a straight line, just below that, uh, as the water, you know, water doesn't just flow straight away. There's a little curve. It goes a little ahead, maybe a two inches and then falls down. So have that, uh, you know, at, on the ground, uh, this uh, cutout section where you have this gravel. And then once uh, you have done it for, a, for the edge of your roof like this, uh, and you then you can uh, contour that. You, you can turn that on the ground as the, the land slopes in your property. Now, this I'm talking about is for a home, uh, you know, that's on uh, ground, uh, straight away, whether it's ground floor or ground plus one, uh, and you have land around it, which you can dig. Uh, uh, but I'll just come next to the um, case where, you know, if it's in a society, if it's in a city. Um, so this first thing is that uh, you uh, run these beds with the gravel along your roof line so that the water falls into it. And then at the end of it, look at the land which is sloping and you just contour that towards your slope. And somewhere at the edge of your property, you can have a pit where all of this water goes into. And uh, it's even a better idea not to put it directly in your well. Um, and instead uh, a few feet away from your well to make a pit so that as the water collects, it goes through the soil and it gets filtered. And then it goes down to the aquifer that is, you know, uh, filling up your well. So that way it's filtered water that will go down and then enter your water aquifer of your well. And uh, similarly, if you are in a city, you know, uh, the main thing is that uh, with all of the tarring and all of these, you know, paver blocks everywhere, uh, the water is just coming from the building roofs and it's hitting down and it's just running off into the road and it's going into the big sewers and it's going out into the ocean. So uh, the problem is that uh, your ground is not getting any water. So even in such societies, uh, you know, somewhere they could, along this pathway, they could make this gravel uh, that, you know, uh, uh, has a contour and one edge of the property, they could make some kind of hole where it goes into the ground. And so that water, the water table in that place starts coming up, you know, uh, every year after year. And uh, Romain, I remember you, I have, uh, you know, those pictures where you had shown uh, how mm -hmm. those uh, construction were done, where they made holes, and maybe that could use, be used for a society as well? Of course, of course, that, has, that can be used for a society or in your home. Or like Abhina was talking about, the developers have to be put on the block for that. Even before they get about putting their roads and laying their roads, they can put those rainwater harvesting trenches across it. So it's all in place rather than calling after the problem arises, where should we put that and where should we put this? So that's why we got the, the CREDI, which is the nodal authority that approves buildings to float this manual. It's a, it's a doable manual that is available and I can give it to anybody to implement it. So this was given to the builders lobby to execute. And a lot of the builders took it up in Chennai and, and especially in Pune, a lot of builders were excited about this aspect of saving water because in Chennai, you buy water from day one in moving into your flat. Right, so uh, would you like me to bring up that presentation of yours where yes. you had showed this solution? Yeah, so I'll just uh, yeah. bring it up. So, as, as outlined, uh, we wanted to tackle the government because the government owned the roads and uh, Chennai was, this happened in Chennai where the first prototype was done and the second one. Um, we realized that the government was spending more on stormwater drains. Chennai waits for the whole year for two weeks of rain, which, is, which was a definite thing around uh, October, November, when it is now happening and we're having floods. So every time there would be some sort of flooding, flash floods, and people waiting, everybody's waiting for this glorious moment where Chennai will have its annual monsoon, and then it's gone. But what they prepared for was stormwater drains. 
stormwater drains run parallel uh, alongside the roads and, and they are set well in advance, which is like August, preparing for this grand uh, moment when Chennai will get its rains, only to ensure against flooding. Now, isn't that a ridiculous thing we thought? You're, you're preparing the ground to flush out your precious rainwater along with garbage and everything else to the, to the rivers, to the sea, or directly to the sea. So the thought came, why don't we do something that pins the government? And this is exactly what I'm waiting for, because this is something that the government having go has gone through two years of solid problems. Isn't it time that somebody said to them that, would you like to do something that's doable on your roads instead of blaming the PWD and uh, bad quality and this and that? It's too much of water, too little cambering or whatever that's required and uh, loss of the road in the end. And if there's bad workmanship, then definitely there's going to be no road left. And most of all, where is this precious rainwater going? It's Goa is going the way Chennai is going or Kerala or any other city that's facing this problem. So this is a concept, the blueprint for rainwater harvesting on the road, which is very simple. Now this particular blueprint, which is uh, on the screen, can be done in your compounds, on your in your fields. It's very simple. It goes to about eight to 10 feet where you hit your subsoil uh, layer and a layer of brick, uh, brick layer, layer of brick, layer of sand, river sand, and a solid grill on the top six inch grill so as you get and put it at the on the on the low lying areas on the cambering of your property depending on where the, your your water flows and then you've trapped all that water into your ground so if you have a well on your uh, on your fee in your field or or wherever that you want this is for groundwater recharge absolute groundwater recharge this is what that could be done the vertical uh, pits. The other one is transfers across the roads. This is the concept. There's a diagram which can be easily understood. The sand filling, the broken bricks. You can put charcoal for drinking water purposes. A layer of charcoal you'll see there is filling that further filters uh, the water. And the section of the grill cover which should be solid of course, especially when vehicles are going to move over it or there's uh, chance of breakage, it has to be done properly and strong enough. So, and with the uh, perforations that, uh, that can be cleaned from time to time. Uh, next. So this is to scale and this is a pro, this is something somewhere where it is very vital and looking at Goa the way it is, this looks exactly like the Panjim uh, bridge, which this is one of Chennai's famous flyovers and uh, Right now, I don't know if anybody is following the news of Chennai, all these flyovers are flooded despite all, all the efforts, you know, there's still a long way to go because they've, it's, it's gone on for too long and there's been too much damage and continuous damage and continuous filling of water bodies, which is what has led to this problem. So coming to a city like Panjim, underpasses is what has to be looked at, where these pits can be put and a vehicle can go over a 10 um, ton truck can go over that um, kind of uh, steel. And uh, for assessing where you're going with this, if somebody would like to do a study like this uh, before they even sink uh, a rainwater harvesting trench, you, there's augering that's required to find out your subsoil. And then you have a little, an, an extra pipe that assesses how much water you saved, the water meter, how much water you saved from doing it. But while doing this, it involves the government, the PWD engineers, there's permissions required from the government. So this could be taken on less congested roads, which get a batting for after the rains and you, you'll notice it from the loose uh, um, gravel on the road that that's been thrashed by water and that's the main uh, area where the water force is. So if that's put across the road, as you can see, this was carefully done in a, in a, in a busy uh, colony, quite an upbeat, up, upbeat colony where all the who's who live. And uh, this was constantly waterlogged. And this, these pits were dug, a trench dug, and uh, it's pre, the, the whole uh, beam is precast 
separately. The pits are dug and the aggregate put in and set uh, all in a day. And uh, in, in advance, your, your beans are preset and if there are lips cut. So it's just put over. So there's a little bit of con inconvenience in the time that this is being set. And there could be a diversion of traffic and it's over. And it's in level with the road, it doesn't stick above the road and it has uh, slots that allow the rainwater to seep in. So this can be done anywhere within, within the premises, in, across the roads and even in your gardens. Maybe, you know, if, your water, if you're on a slope and your water is running off via your gate or something, you could have a simple cambering done here. It's, it's got a, you can see the precast, it should have a mild curve to prevent the, the debris from flowing into the trench, which has to be clean from time to time. And these are sim simple pipes, square pipes that are available in any uh, hardware store. If it's done in our initial prototype, we did in five feet, but it, it then required a crane to lift it. But if it's, if it's done in smaller slabs, then it's easy for just two men to lift and put it very quickly done. So that's simple, basic um, uh, um, construction work. I mean, anybody who knows how to con uh, construct a slab and you can see the mild curve and that was the, the steel used for the top slab. So there's a manual that, I mean, this can be given to anybody who wants to, but this really is remarkable for increasing your groundwater um, recharge. I mean, preventing your roads from getting uh, flooded and spoilt, mosquito infestation after the, after the rains, which will happen now, everybody will be suddenly talking about dengue and a lot of, a lot of other problems, health problems that will arise from this. So it, it covers four points. Um, easy to do, but there has to be the political will to allow these things to happen in Goa. Privately, it can be done within complexes where you don't need the governments and, and that could bring the attention of the government, which is what the builders lobby could do for Goa. Um, this is one way of bringing, uh, I mean, when they know that, you know, your wells are increasing, you don't have a water shortage after this, I think the government can take it up on a war footing over here. Simple and easy to do. You can get sponsors for it. In fact, I, I would suggest that, and the way we looked at it, like get a sponsor on the roads that are flooded and ask the sponsor to pay for this, whatever it costs. It just, it just means the cement, the steel, and uh, the labor and the aggregate. That's all that's required. Surely, any sponsor could take this up in his locality and see for himself and, and do his city and himself a favor, uh, wherever his factory is or his office is. You know, for instance, I always say Panjim, MG, uh, MG Road. You know, I, you know I, whenever there's flooding, all the traders are out in arms. I mean, they should be put to, to, I mean, they should be requested to do something like this rather than talk about a perennial problem that they're going to be facing. And in fact, more problems will, are going to be coming up. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Romain. So yeah, and especially for people who are, you know, um, having uh, big uh, uh, plots of land, especially for farmers at the time that they are contouring their land and planning for their, uh, you know, planting beds. As uh, I do this also on two of my plots, one is around my house and then I have another 6,600, uh, you know, uh, square feet uh, plot where I am uh, uh, growing food. Uh, so an important thing is that uh, to see that uh, all the uh, rainwater that's coming into your plot, you see, how do you trap it? And uh, if everybody starts doing that, it's seen that it does not leave your plot. And if it's leaving your plot, where it is, where is it going? That's the question. If it's leaving your plot and going into the ground or some place that is feeding, you know, the uh, the water aquifer, uh, then it's fine. But if it's just uh, running off and going into some stream and then finding its way into the ocean, then we have lost that water. It's not uh, retained in the ground and 
if it was retained in the ground, then your groundwater level would come up and your wells would start getting filled. So even when you are designing your farm, uh, you have got to see the slopes. Uh, there may be, you know, one, two or three slopes uh, that you have. Uh, around my house, I've got uh, two kind of slopes. One is coming from one direction to the other. And then uh, in the front of my house, it goes uh, through the front where my car comes in. And on my ancestral plot, it's just one slope uh, from the top side of the land where the road is. And then it slopes a little down into the field. And uh, the water flows into a field at the lower level. So the important thing is that how to conserve most of the water in your space and charge your groundwater. So as you do your planting beds and, you know, uh, the planting beds are higher and where you walk, it is lower. So water is going to collect there. So you start contouring those lower walkways and bring them along the slope to some place or a corner in your property, uh, maybe, uh, you know, where you can dig a pit and kind of get it into the groundwater. And the diagrams what uh, 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 Romain has shown, uh, very simple things, one layer after the other layer of stones, because then as the water goes in, it percolates, and then it goes horizontally into that. So uh, that takes a lot of uh, uh, water. So now uh, the idea is yeah, you bring it into the ground and see where your wells are close by and try to connect it to the aquifer uh, that is feeding your well. So that was, you know, one very important point. Uh, so looking at the slopes of your land, uh, so it goes in design. Uh, even now, if you are, have already done your farm, uh, you should see how much of uh, water is leaving your property and accordingly do this design. Coming to uh, Daryl, just a, so the farm in Chennai, this is what we did. It, it was totally waterlogged. I mean, you know, it's it's on the banks of a lake. I mean, very close to the lake. So it was impossible to do anything but grow paddy there. And I had to uh, keep certain parts of the land dry so that I could do my work and other plantations. In the In the monsoon, it would be absolutely wet. And then after that, hard ground, like what uh, Captain was saying. No percolation, just hard ground. So what we did was actually plow it up, keep it as it was, and then cut these channels. And uh, we worked out the water flow. So the water stays on, stayed on these two plots. It, it could, we could have allowed it to go off to the lake, you know. But uh, we, wanted the, we wanted our uh, wells to come up. So well, everybody's struggling for water, their wells go down. And, and you know, we always have water around the year. And I, I was just checking with the guy and I said, uh, you know, the, because I'm not there in Chennai now. And he says, don't worry. Everything is so slowly seeping into our own land. We are not losing the water. I said, see that we save that water. We don't want it to go. Don't let it out because then that will be good for my trees. And it's already a forest there. So it's a very important point uh, of, of, of catching your water, using your own farm as a catchment. So that, that if implemented, I think all these farmers wouldn't be suffering because they just have these sluice gates that, that are dysfunctional right now, the ones that are doing their fields and the Kazan lands. I just visited a couple of lands yesterday and they said, oh, we, you know, either it's too much of rain or, uh, you know, there's nothing that we could do here. So we've just left it. And I was just talking to them that you should, you should save this water. They, you know what, they have just have this little uh, pond kind of thing that dries up. And once the pond dries up, their work also dries up. They don't do anything with that. So if they did this kind of contouring, and when they have all this lovely rain, extended monsoon, imagine what farmers here could do. If we could put that out, I, and I told them, you just give me these lands, please, if you don't want to do anything with it, and we'll, tell, we'll show you what you can do with it. Some of them is a little higher ground where you can grow vegetables. And of course, some is they're doing some fish farming and, uh, you know, from slow skates. So you have a mix of both. This is absolute Kazan land I'm talking about. But there's some land on the higher ground where they've been growing vegetables. But so, you know, I, uh, for um, 
all of our viewers who have been uh, through watching all the videos of the summit and being here on these uh, webinars. Um, I hope you are understanding now how vitally it is important for a self-sustained, you know, community uh, to have their own water resource. So all of these uh, rainwater harvesting techniques and you know putting the water into the ground is going to give you uh, the design should be such that it can give you water all through the year. The more mm -hmm. amount of conservation you do, the more amount of pond, lake, and well water you will have all throughout the year. And then you do not need to be dependent on any other source or you know uh, uh, government supply of well water mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, because all excess from the land that's uh, getting wasted is going into the sea. Uh, so it's our loss, you know. Um, and the second point, I'm just re reiterating once more, um, if everybody has understood very uh, clearly what Captain Lobo had presented, was that although you take in water from your municipality or your well, and then you use it and it in your bathrooms and your toilets, and that's what we're calling gray water and black water, then from a system, it gets uh, treated by bioenzymes. It is broken down. It is made into nutritious water that goes and through the piping system in the plant, it feeds, uh, you know, a uh, pump. It feeds all your plants. So that means you do not need any excess water to uh, water your plants with. So you save on that. And the other thing is that uh, these pipes under the ground, they're just about a foot lower and they feed the roots directly. And the roots take up all of that water, meaning that uh, not uh, that water does not even go down more than one or two meters into the uh, you know water aquifer that is feeding your well. Meaning that this water will not even contaminate your groundwater because the trees are going to pull it up and not you know allow it to go one you know two meters down. And if every home, independent home, starts doing this, right? Uh, so that's the second advantage is that uh, there's no uh, sewage water that is continuously steep, steeping into the soil year after year and then finally reaching your water aquifer of your well and contaminating it. So if every house does it, you have to just think of it as a recirculatory system, right? That you are uh, you're getting it from the municipality, you're using it and you're dirtying it, then you're, it's the, uh, getting you know broken down, make, making it be made good again. And then it's absorbed by all your plants. So as Captain Lobo showed us that it's not only for individual homes, but big societies as well. And this is what should happen in, you know, all of the cities, metro cities, what we were showing earlier. And that will help uh, automatically once you start processing this water, of course, you have to feed it to plants. So then in your society or in your compound, you have to start putting plants and you have to start getting greenery. And that is going to increase the oxygen and the beauty and the flowers and fruits and everything that you're going to get. So these are very important uh, systems uh, to be implemented everywhere. Sure. Now, uh, I would uh, uh, come to the next part of this discussion, which is uh, these innovative ideas. Uh, how do we implement them in our villages, in our cities and, you know, across the country? Uh, so the talk is now about uh, people, you know, who have been, uh, especially uh, people on this panel and the previous uh, uh, New Earth Summit uh, webinars and, uh, uh, you know, convention that we had also in Goa. Uh, it is about all of us getting together uh, in each state. There were the pioneers, the people who are putting this forward and forming a group and uh, to implement these projects. Uh, so we're calling that the, you know, uh, water, yeah, like a water treatment, uh, uh, a water conservation committee, right? So, uh, Abhinav, I would like to ask you, you know, who are the people who should be in the this water conservation committee? If you just think about Goa, right? And you, we want that these wonderful uh, projects of re conserving, recycling water and all, if they be done in a proper way and if they happen all across uh, Goa or any other state uh, for the purpose of abundance of water. Because now we know it's all in the news across the world that the next water, I mean, wars are, are called water wars because people are not having enough water. So obviously, this is a very dire, urgent need that has to be done right now. 
so we have to do something because the current system is not making it happen yes there are people in the government and they are doing their jobs and they are doing whatever they are supposed to do but it looks like uh, it has to be a people's movement because if every house has to do it right it has to be a people's movement so how do we take this education to the people how do we form this committee who should be there in it and how should this committee work to make this happen abhinav uh, so yes if you could uh, first share who are the people who should be in this uh, committee uh, uh i i have not given it too much of a thought as to who should be there in this committee but kind, i will kind of just people. i will just think loudly yeah no no i kind of kind of people only but uh, i will just think loud uh so uh, one that comes to my mind is uh, architects uh, who who take up or like who design projects like no who plan these projects so architect should is should should be one person who should should be on the you know on the panel uh, second person i can think of is uh, somebody from the construction uh, industry in the sense uh, who who build projects so you no know, uh, who who maybe a builder or maybe somebody who is into construction uh, of projects maybe or... maybe a representative of a builder's lobby or a builder's con- consortium huh, correct 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 right. correct so the, uh, these are the two then uh, then there would be uh, there should be some representation from somebody who is into uh, uh, landscaping because uh, ultimately when when you uh, when you uh because uh, i am talking about uh, as as, lo- as far as the construction and uh, you know, projects are 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 are, uh, are concerned because uh, whenever you do construction you need somebody to landscape it and there are uh, there are plants which have to you know somebody from the forest so somebody with with the knowledge of no which trees uh, uh, require how much water no which which trees are helping in no uh, seeping of water uh, in, in the earth so somebody with that knowledge need not be a landscape person but somebody with the knowledge of trees who, right. who uh, where, where no which trees to be grown where uh, and uh, no if if a uh, uh, somebody f- from the conservation uh, like background like you no know, if there is a barren land how do you uh, make it into a forest so forest making somebody making a barren land into forest is the biggest thing that somebody can do for water conservation because um, that land will then act as a uh system in itself where the, it will all uh, no uh, naturally it will um recharge the soil below that recharge the aquifers and no it will be a natural system we don't have to build any recharge structures or no uh, recharging pits etc naturally it will take care so there could be one uh, uh, representation where all the barren lands uh, which are there like no bod ke dongor mantad kok kokanin te ka so uh, wherever there is a, a a a a small hillock it, it does not have too much of trees so when we have plant those trees there and when it becomes a forest it it's like a huge thing uh, as far as water conservation is concerned so that could be one uh, person for, from that area uh, area of expertise um somebody from the plumbing uh, plumbing industry so uh, a lot of water uh, gets leaked uh, because of uh, various uh, no uh, things that people don't know about like no there are some things which are very basic things which people don't even the uh, no some uh, like unprofessional or i don't i wouldn't call anybody like that but um, so because of um, lack of knowledge maybe you no know, some things that are not taken care taken care of and then a lot of water starts leakage uh, leaking so somebody from the plumbing industry who who can uh, you know uh, be on that panel so that person knows okay, how to yes I, yeah uh, i'm getting it so and uh, perhaps we need to you know give a number also and you know publicize some campaign wherever water wastage or water cracks you know absolutely. and pipes and all absolutely. are happening absolutely and absolutely how do you fix that, that? Yeah. and yeah. Uh, complain yes yeah so not not only that uh, not only in the public spaces but even at the household level because a lot yeah. of people do not know how to fix even a washer of their tap and and you no know, because they have to call a plumber for a small like drop drop they just ignore it and then that drop if if it is a one second you uh, know uh, no per 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 like one drop per second it it goes into thousands of liters in a month 
so if if that education and that kind of skill building can happen it can start even at a student like you know fifth sixth standard student level and you know if they can turn into those fixing of water so we 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 uh, had a good name for that as you know tips for taps like that not tip and tap like that so okay. so uh, that can that can also start and it could be a, you know, we can add a lot of fun to the fun to this exercise of awareness of how do we can do, so this is like demand side management where you no know, you reduce the demand by fixing leakages rainwater harvesting is a supply side management technique you know here we are reducing the demand because unnecessarily leakage so all that treatment and all that thing that goes into you know that water to like treatment and the transport and the energy and the resources it comes to your home and then you are just drop by drop just wasting it so that can if that is the easiest thing to do you no know, the least a uh, cost uh, thing that that somebody can so a campaign on that so so zero water leakage homes could be that campaign no that home yeah. does not have even it one drop of water counts <laughs> sorry exactly. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so counts. those those kind of campaigns can be run and i'm i'm happy to you know be part of any any of this uh, like uh, campaigns and uh, committees or you know, however however you call, want to call them but you know one one we are doing this is you know these students that pass out from iti you know the technical things they they have a lot of these students that learn plumbing and things like that they yeah. can be, you can have like a, a network of students that will run out yes <laughs> yes yes so 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 there is one organization one very senior person called uh, Ab- abid surti from mumbai okay and he he has a organization called drop dead and it's i think it is 85 plus now and he goes door to door on weekends every sunday uh with his own resources he goes will along with a plumber and folds his hands and you no know, ask people do you, is there something that we can do for you for making you a zero a zero uh, water leakage uh, home so he goes with a plumber and all the you know usual stuff like washer and those kind of things and they fix them without any charge Hmm. so it's like one man uh, like initiative and he has saved so many thousands and lakhs of waters in mumbai so something like that you know could also start it it could be a small start but that that impact that it has on the on the on the families and on the citizens and the community it's huge in terms of awareness and in terms of the you know water that is saved because of this so thanks uh, abhinav uh, for the ideas romin uh... any more kind of people or uh, that should be in this committee and then after that yeah what are the things this committee can do you know, the credai they have a unit in goa as well the credai uh, which is the body that approves buildings they can just put it into their systems that rainwater harvesting has been adopted but something a little more that saves a larger volume of water confederation uh, i mean what's the uh, credai uh, what's expansion i mean well everybody knows credai confederation of indian industry is different this credai is the body that approves buildings so every builder will have every city will have a credai unit here that will be approving the the buildings before they come to the master plan it has to pass through credai it would be nice to put these ideas forth to to some some committee like that that can then implement it uh, through the builders imagine look at all those societies and complexes coming up there mushrooming by the day uh, yeah. if, if if all that's going to come into force 170 flats 40 flats what where are we going with all this consumption at least that check at least you know the monsoon rain will be saved for at least their own consumption of their flats that they are putting up and and credai can do a lot i mean whatever governing body here that approves buildings now you you have i think you have a slightly different system maybe uh, the town and planning department i mean but it's another it's another story but if if there is somebody that can be approached to implement these things for the sake of you know conservation of water i think any good officer would like to look at things like this a little differently as long as as long as he doesn't have to pay from his pocket you know 
it, it's it's just permissions that have to be in place. Right. Um, so I just want to add, uh, you know, one more kind of type of person uh, to this committee, and especially this is for you know villages and uh, uh, which is uh, a permaculturist. Uh, because they also have very innovative designs of on the land, uh, especially for uh, water, uh, you know, conservation and uh, for water recycling as well. And uh, then the, the next is, you know, once we have um, understood that these kind of people should be in the committee, uh, how can we start this committee? So, for example, informally, if we can start it. Uh, uh, like I've started a couple of other committees in Goa, we just, you know, made a WhatsApp group and we uh, got the people first here in, on the webinar into that. And then others who have experience in this field and have done work that has helped in the city, this city or other cities, you know, we can invite them into that uh, group and then start, you know, uh, sharing ideas and uh, you know having some maybe a weekly meet to uh, make our ideas concrete and take it to the next step and then maybe in three or six months you know it could be made into a formal committee like a registered society uh, for you know better functioning because when we want to do a uh, work like you know make uh, uh, certain campaigns and all that of our own funds uh, then, yeah, we will need some funds. Maybe the members put it in, or you know, if this is publicized, maybe we connect with organizations who have a, uh, you know, CSR who are going to, who need to put in money back into the system uh, instead of you know giving it away as taxes. And I'm sure the committee of you know very well qualified and experienced people who have done the work start making such project reports that uh, this is one project for this part of the city, or this can be done all over the city and they put it up to such companies, then uh, funding can definitely come from there. So as opposed to just one person or one company, you know, trying to uh, make a proposal. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Rumin, uh, uh, Binav, what else can this uh, committee do? Um, and one thing that we shared yesterday also is the mainly because this is a people's participative project. So the idea was also that why not make a small movie or documentary, something that's interesting, you know, to show people maybe through a movie that how water is being wasted and what are the solutions, you know, for different spaces. Uh, and only when people, you know, even watch, I mean, this is also a kind of educative video that's going to be, that is being recorded, will be shared, shared on our YouTube channel and we'll publicize it. So the basic science and techniques and arguments for, you know, uh, people would understand. But I'm sure everybody loves a good movie. And, you know, we can make a nice movie that can go viral, uh, you know, all across the place. Any more ideas besides that, what this uh, committee can do? Video is a very good idea. And uh, in that video, you can uh, think of various uh, different things that uh, can, that can go into the video, right from you know, how we receive uh, water from various sources and what happens. Uh, you know, so the complete picture, a lot of people you know, don't know because they all of them think that the water comes from the tap. And, and not from anywhere else, you know, especially you know, uh, students, if they if they get to know from where actually the water comes, how it is treated, how much is the pumping that goes into it and how much is the uh, chemicals for, for treatment that goes into it. So if all that you know, is shown in a video, you see it, then you, you know, come to know that, okay, so much of things goes into it. That is why I should then now be careful in what we are, we are using and what, because unless you see it, like it just comes from the tap for them you no know? so so if 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 that is shown they you know the behavior automatically changes and they appreciate uh, how it has uh, you know how much of effort and what all the things have gone into it and that that definitely would help yes and and once again yeah to make a movie it takes time resources if you want to do a good one and you want to have some actors and all that is going to take fun so once again the thing is uh, you know to make the project on paper and you know That's get it to right. some companies and their csr you know make a lovely three four projects and i'm sure there will be companies you know jumping to uh, put in their money to have such uh, good ha things happening in their city 
Yes, Rumi. Theater. Get a theatrist of that village or somebody famous to do a little skit for each village. Yes. Because people grasp that. I know they flock for that, whether it's Lent or anything, that's the catch. Especially in our village. I mean, I've never seen such a turnout. So they, they could be used to put across messages like this. Definitely, definitely. And yes, it should be a very comprehensive movie because we know we have seen small videos. Some video, I've seen this video of the person that uh, Bina Vapte was talking about uh, who goes around in Bombay. So that's, you know, one wonderful theme. And uh, we need to have all the themes in, you know, one nice uh, movie, whether it is going to be half an hour, 45 minutes, or even one hour. And then, of course, it can be dubbed in different languages. So, uh, so yes, something like that would definitely require funding and uh, a great, you know, uh, project for a CSR funding. Uh, any more ideas on what this committee can do? Uh, one was campaign also. So campaign is something that can happen, you know, even before the movie, as the movie takes shape and time. Campaign can be some uh, pamphlet, some literature, uh, you know, explaining all of this and people, you know, circulating that. Uh, and uh, the, yeah, the, the best place is the school, you know, catch them young and, you know, give them the right education. Um, do you know of any such campaign organization, for example, since you're in Goa, do you know any uh, organization in Goa that is taking this water conservation through some educative pamphlets across the schools or colleges? I am not aware. I am not aware of this, but I uh, do this as long as energy is concerned. So, so I am uh, doing this for twenty-five schools in Goa, high schools, and uh, to save, uh, like, to have, have forming energy conservation clubs in those schools where you no, know, they are guided by a teacher and uh, resource material is given to them. So, about water, I am I am not uh, aware of any anything. Yes, Abhinav. Mean, uh, thanks for that. You know, the entrance to my house, there was a nice uh, picture. I just wanted to see that whether it's on a board. They say I wanted to go and see whether I could just uh, pull it out. Because just in one picture, it showed uh, this whole, uh, you know, countryside. And then the trees are cut, you know, how the water doesn't percolate. And there was some diagram about it showing that uh, cutting of trees. So I just wanted to show that one paper, uh, which is just one page of a, cat, you know, a pamphlet that can go to students. And the picture itself, you know, uh, itself uh, says a thousand words so maybe that also can be a very good educative tool because movie will take time maybe three to four months or six months so i'm just i'm, I'm taking notes actually i'm putting all of this down in the uh, document discussion so it'll be saved and we will work on it uh, as soon as we make this committee i will start this telegram group uh, for goa and this is the same thing what uh, people can do in other states across this country uh, get together the people uh, who have already done the work and whose, you know, whose energy and whose enthusiasm and blood is in it to do, you know, good uh, uh, water conservation and treatment systems. And um, as uh, we, when we want to expand this committee, we just keep on inviting more people of that caliber who have been doing and uh, it forms a support group to, you know, crystallize their ideas, bringing more science and make things more natural and cost effective. Okay. So this is what, you know, the as, company can do. As, as you were talking, one, two, three, two more things came to my mind. One of them should be an expert in GIS. GIS mapping, mapping of you no know, places where you no, know, uh, which need intervention, and somebody should come uh, with a data background. Like how much of data? How if, if this is like too much of data that we will get into, and how to manage that data uh, is is another challenge. So you no, know, how to do that data analysis? How to do that data crunching and get uh, a good uh, hand of uh, how maybe a water map of Goa, like you no. Know, like how we yes. have these heat maps, you no? Know, if somebody can make that kind of a map, we come to know where should we you know where is the intervention, maximum intervention required, where should we plant more trees, where should we do harvesting, where should we, where should we do? So those kind of skill sets would help in this committee. Very good, very good point. And this, yeah, the second one you, you were saying there were two. Point. Yeah, so one is GIS and one is data. Like, you know, GIS is uh, somebody who is into that geographical uh, mapping, etc. And somebody who is like good at, uh, once the data is received, good at analyzing the data and presenting in a way which, which is uh, easy for people to understand and you know, make reports and those kind of things. 
Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, Abhinav, and now, yeah, uh, we have a few, couple of questions which I will uh, share from the audience and I'll just put them up to you. So, for Manish Patel, uh, whether the footpath fever blocks should be replaced by uniformly graded aggregates. Romain, would, would you want to take that? Yeah, footpath could be. Yeah, you could you could use it on the footpaths, but the the problem would be we'd have to use the pits and not the cambered um, trenches. It's like so, how to block over manholes uh, on level with that. I didn't I didn't figure out the question meaning in terms of visibility. Yeah. I didn't get it. So what, if you could just clarify, I think he was the footpath the paper blocks should be replaced by uniformly graded aggregates. What does that mean? Uniformly graded aggregates? No, I think he was referring to what you were saying about the gravel under okay. the blocks to put it on the pavements. Oh, yes, yes. Instead of, yeah, okay, got it, got it. So instead of wasting all the time for you know, yeah. to put all of this together with binding material and going in a factory, you just take gra gravel and you, uh, so that's, yeah, gravel, that's not, uh, you know, big, that, that will hurt you, but uh, very uniform gravel. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess many spaces that, that can be done where um, safety is not, uh, you know, concerned. So yes, yeah, so we'll come to the end of uh, today's session. Um, if any more ideas uh, uh, you want to put uh, across, please do, uh, panelists. Uh, otherwise, we can back them. Yeah. Yeah. One, one more thing is, uh, one more is that you know, uh, uh, somebody with, with their technology, like, you no, know, uh, how do you treat water? So, somebody on the panel. Okay, yes. Right. So, so you no know, that uh, chemical microbes that knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Got it. So I just noted that down as well. Because so there are two ways you no know, of treating. One is that natural way by with microbes, and there is a, a way in which you need to use some chemicals. So, what chemicals to use in how, how much? Uh, so somebody with that with that kind of a background and knowledge. So I will end with a big uh, thank you to our panelists and also to uh, Captain Lobo. Um, thanks to audience as well for being here today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at the same time uh, via the same link for our day 23 topic, Oceans, Coast and Marine Life Committee. So on this, we are mainly going to talk about, first talk about what are the problems that our oceans and coasts are, uh, you know, uh, facing and the marine life also, why the marine life is dying. And it's got to do something with the, one of the aspects is the way our metro cities and smart cities are designed. Uh, and that's very insightful. You'll get to understand tomorrow how that is damaging sea life and also the amount of oxygen that is made every day on the planet. Okay, so uh, tune in uh, tomorrow if you want to understand that because so many, I mean most, most of these uh, webinars will show you how the ordinary person every day is participating unknowingly to the damage and destruction of this planet. That's why we are at such a stage, you know, where uh, we don't see any, you know, uh, future beyond 25 years. And if we want a future, then uh, people have to participate and they have to understand the whole flow and correct themselves where uh, needed. Uh, and also at the same time, they need to know the alternative and the solution because that's when you can correct yourself. Uh, so join us tomorrow and uh, namaste everyone. Have a lovely evening. And thanks once again to our panelists for being with us today.